Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, it is so good to be back with our dozen of listeners. Uh, <laughs> all ones of you. All ones of you, but we do appreciate the ones. We really do. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful to be back, uh, and we are back with more Buffy the Vampire Slayer, uh, and we're and hopefully back having a little bit of fun. I know the last episode we did... Uh, uh, we had to talk about some heavy things, and so it was a little bit more of a taxing episode. And as I said in the the the, the actual episode, technical difficulties uh, prohibited us from posting that when we did. Um, uh, and a lot of stuff has come out since, or rather, just more people coming out and uh, in support of Charisma Carpenter. Yes, very much so. Which, first of all, is amazing if this would have happened, you know, 24 years ago and she would have said something, then there's no way that uh, she would have had such a, a backing or support. Um, and second of all, it also kind of just confirms what they're saying, you know? Yeah. And uh, one thing I do want to bring up, because I, I feel a little bit like a heel, even though listening back to the uh, the episode that we recorded, I made a point of stating this, uh, is that at the time, not a lot of the male actors had come out. Um, Anthony Stewart Head was the only one, and you found that really great uh, bit from him. And I, I think, I didn't mean to sound accusatory when, when we were talking about that. It was just an observation. But we should point out that at this point, a lot of the male uh, mm -hmm. co-stars have voice. Uh, James Marston, uh, Marsters. Uh, uh, yes, James Marsters. Marsters. I always Marston. say. <laughs> James Marston is enchanted. Yeah, yeah. Black, I always say their last names wrong. Spike. Let's just go. No confusing well, there. James Marsters, and we haven't even met Spike yet on Buffy. Um, so I'm sure we'll hear more about him in the future. But he is notorious for being a nice guy. And having been to, you know, a fan convention and listened to him talk and, and taken, um, taken pictures with him, um, I, I can tell you that at least in that setting, um, yeah, he was a very open and nice and generous guy. So it doesn't surprise me at all that he was one of the first um, uh, fellas to jump on board with that, back backing up Charisma Carpenter. Uh, also, uh, Danny Strong, who plays... Um, Jonathan. What, what was his character's name? Isn't it Jonathan? Jonathan. Yeah. I, couldn't, mm -hmm. I couldn't, remember, uh, couldn't remember his name, but yeah, he... Um, he uh, he voiced up. Also, uh, I just came across this one today. Uh, J. August Richards, who plays Gun on Angel. Oh yeah. Um, uh, spoke out. So uh, I think that the other guys in the um, in the you know Nerd Patrol villain um, Tom Lank and uh, oh the other one whose name is going to escape me right now. I think all three of them actually came out. And they did. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And uh, the one that I find interesting uh, when I was looking at it uh, that some people were pissed off about, but I, I I have a hard time understanding why they they were pissed off. Uh, so David Boreanaz uh, came out. He had a very simple tweet about you know I support you and all this. And what I noticed, this is one of the only ones Charisma Carpenter actually responded to. Hmm. Where she responded to him saying, I know you're there, and I want to thank you for all the support that you've given me since Wednesday, meaning the Wednesday that she posted her tweet, meaning that, at least the way I'm interpreting this, is that he must have been in contact with her privately. I would assume so, yes. For her to say that. And so, first of all, I found that a really nice thing that, and the fact that, I, again, it sounds like that he was, this wasn't just a, I haven't seen you in 10 years. Here's a, you know, a, here's a pacifier tweet. It, right. it, it sounds like he, they, they've actually been in contact, but people were still pissed off at him. 
Really? Yeah, I was reading a lot of the tweets um, going, oh, this is just a, a cardboard apology or a paper apology. Uh, you were the star of the show. You should have known something was going on. And I... The thing is, is like we talked about um, before, when there is a predator and he is, um, and I would say in, in this instance, Joss Whedon would definitely be labeled as a predator. Yeah. Um, when you are a predator, you know whom you can be a predator in front of. You know who you can display your predatory behavior to. So I would imagine that a lot of these males were not privy to, to the, the um, behaviors or not privy to the display of the behaviors um, that have been coming out. Um, so, yeah. And the, and the other thing, and this is the thing that gets me, is it just shows kind of a, an ignorance of how TV shows and movies and plays and show business, how that works. Just because you're playing the title character, that doesn't mean you have any level of control over what's going on. Well, especially something like Buffy, because, I mean, how easy would it have been to be like, oh, Angel's dead and his spirit is moved into a different body. Yeah. Like, now he's gun is the new angel. You know, like, I mean... It's a supernatural world. You can do whatever you want. Yeah. So Just I how mean, got Cordy off in the first place, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, but that, that was just like, obviously, again, this is the only one of these things that I've seen that she responded to. And it's so, it's like, what more do you want from the guy? No. And I mean, there is a limit, especially if they didn't actually witness any behavior, there's a limit to what you can do anyways. Someone of David Boreanaz's ilk, and here's the thing. Okay, I'm not the biggest David Boreanaz fan. I I enjoy Angel. I enjoy Buffy. I've watched him in everything he's done since then. You know, I've I've rewatched Bones a bazillion times. Um, he as a person is is not really um, fan friendly. Um, I know when I've seen him in panels and things, he won't necessarily go back and answer questions about Buffy verse, or he won't go back and answer questions. question. Like now, what is he in now? What is he doing? Now? Uh, SEAL team or something on CBS. Team, I think. Yeah. So like he doesn't go back and answer questions about bones. He doesn't go back and answer questions about Buffy. You know, it's, he's always very focused on his current project. And so to make any kind of acknowledgement at all about what's going on is kind of a big deal for him. He's not a, he's tends to be a very private person. Yeah. So, so I got to give him props for that. Um, I also think that not, not to give any of them an excuse or anything, but when you have so much of your career owing to a specific person, you tend to be very cautious about speaking out against that person. I, I think you're right. And I also think, and this is something that's real easy to forget when we're kind of on the outside looking at it from a fan's perspective, um, that for a lot of these folks, this wasn't just their employer. For a lot of them, it was their friend. Oh, yes. You know, and that's one thing a lot of the reports say is that he had a very select group of people on the inner circle. And to those people, he was supposedly very nice and loving and supportive to. And if you were on the outside of that circle, as Charisma Carpenter um, was, you got the negative. Right. Well, and you can see clearly, you know, he he reuses the same people. Amy Acker, Alexis Denisov, Allison Hannigan, like not just in his big projects like the like the Whedonverse, but also things like um, oh, what was the Shakespeare one he did? Much ado about nothing. Much ado, yeah. Um, so he'll reuse people into in different things. And, you know, even with okay, a couple of years ago, it came out with his 
ex-wife and, you know, bad behaviors have been surfacing and resurfacing over years, but he was still making movies. He was still a powerful person. He was still involved in the DC universe and the Marvel universe. And you don't necessarily want to make a, an enemy out of that, which I can understand that perspective, but I am pleased that people are still standing up for them, you know, still standing behind Charisma Carpenter and still um, um, kind of, I don't want to say canceling Joss Whedon, but making him realize that his actions do have consequences. Yeah. And, and kind of, yeah, kind of like we were saying, not just their careers, but it, it's got to be a hard thing to kind of reconcile that this person that not, you say, not only do you owe your career to in a large chunk, but someone you considered a friend was had this other side to them. That can't be an easy thing to, you know, imagine your, your best friend and all these stories start coming out about your best friend. Uh, that's got to be a difficult thing for people to kind of, you know, come to terms with. Yeah, and I mean, even as a fan, you know, the I know that, that you say you didn't really see him as the, the feminist ideal, but um, to a lot of girls in the 90s, in the early 2000s, like the fact that he was portraying strong female characters and so many of his shows and, and the things he produced were very strongly femininely driven. That's a lot. And they had a lot of ladies in it. Yeah. <laughs> Is basically what I'm saying. And, and in good meaty parts, not just, you know, we're the girlfriends, you know. Um, so to has to see that kind of person turn out to be like a bully and a manipulator and a predator is, I mean, it's not an easy thing to see as a fan. So imagine having that person in your life and looking up to them in that way. And then realizing all of these things is must yeah be no you're, yeah you're absolutely right and like you said that's uh, that's what we've been dealing with as fans uh, that's what we've been dealing with you know just as kind of spectators to all of this and trying to kind of uh, get our get our heads around you know so um, but. We did promise a fun episode and not very special episode part two. So maybe exactly, and you're 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 exactly right. So we we do need to move on, uh, but we I we did want to draw attention to that little bit of uh, of information because it was something we weren't able to cover in the last review because it hadn't happened yet. Um, but you are right. We we we've done the very special episode. Um, we stand by that. I think it was a good episode. Uh, but now we need to move on and talk about, uh, get back to talking about the actual show. Right. You know? Which we will likely, this is not a subject that we have heard the last about. Oh, I no, definitely not. So we will just keep updating as we go. Yep. So, so today anyway. we take a look at uh, Never Kill a Boy on the First Date. And by the way, this is the Date Night podcast. Oh, that thank you. <laughs> No and introduction. I am Rebecca, and I'm here with my handsome boyfriend, Brandon. <laughs> Thank you, baby. Oh, wow. Oh, good thing you caught that. <laughs> so uh, um, we are here to, to uh, review and recap the episodes of the Buffyverse in chronological order. Um, and yes, as you said, this episode is Never Kill a Boy on the First Date. Yes, original air date, March 31st, 1997. Uh, just to help lighten the mood, a uh, little bit of history from that time, uh, from that time period. So at this time in the multiplexes, we <laughs> had some very interesting films taking up, uh, taking up the cinemas at the time this episode was airing. Uh, the Selena biopic, March 21st, 1997. Ooh, one of Jennifer Lopez's first, right? It, yeah. The, uh, the soon-to-be Oscar-winning Crash came out on March 20th, 1997. I was never as into that as everybody else was. I don't think a lot of people were, honestly. Uh, the Tim Allen Opus Jungle 2 Jungle with 
the number two. Yeah, um, definitely saw that one. And, and of course, the most important one, the one that was snubbed for the Oscar, and I'm still very pissed off about it all these years later, Turbo, a Power Rangers movie, came <laughs> out just a few days before this episode, March 27th, 1997. You know, when I saw you look up those movies, I saw your eyes light up. And I was just waiting to see which one it was that you <laughs> lighting up about. <laughs> you just wait till we start. Uh, I convinced her to review Power Rangers episodes on this. <laughs> oh, my gosh. If I could see where it's from. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway. All right. Uh, so here we are. At, what is this? Episode five, I think. Episode five. Season one, episode five. All right. We're stalling because I, I feel like there's not a lot to say about this one. Well, I mean, I think we can still find a way to talk for an hour and a half, so I don't think it's a, <laughs> an issue. Um, one thing we did notice as it starts, there is no intro. Yeah, the little, uh, in every generation, there is what, you know, yeah, the, none of that this time. So the episode must have been running a little long. Right, which, I mean, I feel like there was probably some things they could have cut out. At least four minutes of, you know, oh, and awkward dancing could they, have been cut out. I think they probably could have cut out everything uh, from about the opening credits to the end credits. And I, <laughs> I, I feel, in my opinion. <laughs> Spoilers. Okay. <laughs> So Buff, uh, we start off, Buffy is fighting off a vampire. She stakes him and um, Giles pops up reviewing her performance as, as the slaying happens. And as they're chatting, they find a ring. We actually had a discussion about this, about what happens when a vampire gets dusted. Yeah, because uh, um, they were unclear on if he was looking for the ring or if he was wearing the ring. And it made me start to wonder. So obviously... Uh, when the vampires get dusted in this ep in these episodes, they completely dust like their clothes and everything. There's nothing really left of them. But I was wondering, so that does that count for jewelry? So if I go, I'm a vampire. I go and uh, buy this ring. Don't ask me why I'm going and bring shopping as a vampire, but let's just uh, I buy this ring. I put it on. I get dusted. That does that ring get dusted or does it stay a ring? I mean, how does how does this work? How I'm See, I, and I my, have questions. My opinion is if it's a just a regular ring or a regular um, jewelry or clothes, then it would get dusted too. But if it's like a magical or supernatural thing, it's not going to get dusted. So or. I if it's a plot point. <laughs> All right, cynic. Because <laughs> the plot plot points don't get dusted. Plot points don't get dusted. That's a good one. Buy our t-shirts. Plot points don't get dusted. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's no power of the boner. Oh, we're going to get to that. Don't worry. Uh, 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 so... All right, we see the master. The master's still around because, of course, he's the big bad for the season. And he's reading a prophecy about um, the anointed, who is the master's great warrior. Five will die, and from the ashes, the anointed will rise. And he's pissed off because one of the people who was supposed to help him with this anointed rising was the vampire that just got dusted. Um, so... Uh, we know that the ring is probably going to be um, influential in the plot point. Yes. As and in you fact, said, is in the very next scene. Yes. <laughs> Where they're looking in the library, looking up what it is. There's a sun and three stars on it. And it turns out Buffy actually finds it in a book. Um, trying to, uh, to prove that Buffy's not just a pretty face or a, a, a cheer, cheerleader ditzy girl, I suppose. I think it's that, and it's also trying to show the uh, the more modern thinking versus the dusty old books kind of thing. <laughs> uh, I I will always love the dusty old books, though. Yeah, yeah, dusty old books are awesome. Uh, so it turns out it's from something called the Order of Aurelius, and they're starting to get into this, um, and and. Uh, how many orders is this so far? Okay, so 
we are I, i've i've just now as we were talking i'm starting a new count so anybody who's been listening knows that we do a couple of things when we wrap up we have the best and worst fashion of the episode we have the peril count we started the uh student the literal student body count <laughs> and i have decided right here and now we're starting another actually three more okay three, three more, more counts first off how many bullshit prophecies okay because there are going to be a lot of them that's true There's as these shows goes on there are so many prophecies um how many mysterious orders <laughs> and how many magic MacGuffins? Uh, well, you know, I think you're going to get tired of counting, honey. I, I may, I may, but we, I really, I'm curious about this. So we have one for each of them. We have, of course, the ring may not actually count as a MacGuffin. It's more of a plot point. The ring isn't powerful or doesn't have any magic or doesn't influence anything. It's just there to kind of get us to the next uh, the next story point. Well, we don't necessarily know that it doesn't have any magic. It has no magic that came back to it in the show. There you go. So so I so I don't so I, I take that one back. So we're still at zero for the magic MacGuffin count, but that will happen. <laughs> so Anyways, back to back to the uh, the episode. In walks a boy named Owen who's coming to look for a book about Emily Dickinson. And oh my God, like here is yet another bland boy. Buffy loves bland boys. Like if Buffy was going to tell us her favorite flavor of ice cream, it would be vanilla. <laughs> well now to be fair to be fair it's not another bland boy it's the first bland boy is it the first one this is the first one okay all right so he's the first one owen's our first bland boy i think that okay i think that when she gets into complicated relationships later on they're more interesting but I think that the boys who Buffy has an immediate attraction to are super bland. Oh, they God, They're vanilla yes. pudding. They are baked chicken with no salt. <laughs> okay. They're, yeah. There's no flavor. In and these. yeah, this poor kid. Um, yeah, he is just the every late 90s... Uh, white boy yeah he's got the gelled spiky hair you know he's got the shirt t-shirt with the the blue button down over top of it you know but he's manly and also strong and and mysterious which willow and buffy are talking about in the next scene but also also he's sensitive for he's reading uh emily Angie Dickinson, so you know. Emily Dickinson. Oh. Emily Dickinson, sorry. Yes. Yes, he's so, Emily Dickinson. You know, so uh, so not only is he mysterious and tall and conventionally good looking, uh, but he's also sensitive and warm. What I love about this guy is his complicated hair. You mentioned the uh the 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 spike, but it's weird. It's like it's spike at the front, but the rest of it is flat. Oh, yeah. This is a very popular 90s boy haircut. Oh, yeah. One that um, my my curly-headed, handsome prince that you are probably was never able to accomplish. I can't accomplish any hairstyles. I couldn't even <laughs> grow a mullet properly. It was a beautiful mullet, honey. It wasn't even a mullet, baby. Like, the, my hair is so curly, it just curled up in the back. I didn't even get the long, flowing lot. I couldn't even get the mullet right. <laughs> I couldn't mull it properly. No. Let me mull it over. <laughs> Boo. Boo. You're lucky you're cute. Oh. Uh, so they're at lunch. They're talking about it, uh, about Owen and how awesome he is while Xander's trying to um, 
basically bash him without being too over the top about it. And they look over and Owen's sitting at the table by himself. So, of course, Buffy decides she needs to go and sit with him. Um, but on the way over to the table, Cordelia beats her to it and they have a little tussle. Now here comes a problematic line that I do not like. And I don't actually think fits in with Buffy's character and would not, would not get away with it today. And she says, oh, um, so she bumps Cordelia out of the way and knocks over her tray. And she says, Cordelia's hips are wider than I thought. So I did not appreciate this line. It was very body shamey. Um, it was <sighs> Buffy, while she is Miss Perky Cheerleader Girl, um, has not displayed up to this point any kind of like um, anti-girl behavior. You know, she's very supportive of Willow. She's supportive of, um, oh gosh, what's the name of the, the girl who's the witch? Amy. Amy. She's supportive of Amy. Um, she's not had this like snarky, you know, backstabby girl behavior. And to make a body shaming comment like that, I just, it's, it's very out of character. And it's just, yeah, very snipey. I don't like it. See, this is one of those interesting things, especially I'm trying very hard to keep the, the recent issues out of it and look at it just from a just a 24 years on. Because, yeah, obviously it's not a good line. Um, and it did it never bothered me until you kind of you were you were explaining it earlier. Uh, the reasons it never bothered me originally is um, one if we're taking like the history of the movie into account, it is very in character for Buffy because that was, that's who she was, but you are absolutely right in the show proper. So how most audience has audiences have been introduced to her, that has never been the case. Mm -hmm. So you're right. That is a, uh, that's not something that in keeping with this incarnation of the character we've ever seen. The other reason I, I never really thought about it is because it was her and Cordelia sniping at each other, and they do that a lot. They do that a lot in these first couple seasons. They do, uh, but they don't do it. I, And maybe I will see it more as I go back and rewatch it, but I don't remember a lot of body shaming happening. I don't think there was. I think you're right about that. And so I don't like that that is her go-to with this, is trying to up one-up Cordelia in front of a boy by basically calling her fat. Um, so, yeah. And like you said, trying to just keep the, the current issues out of it, you know, wondering how much influence Joss Whedon had in, in that kind of statement and how Charisma Carpenter would have felt about her character being called fat when she very and as i said before fat is not a slur fat is not a bad thing fat is just a description of shape but for charisma carpenter who is very a very slender person um to have that you know thrown at her on screen to be broadcast on television i wonder how that felt to her um I, I, of course, I can't answer that. I don't, no one but Charisma Carpenter can. And if Charisma Carpenter is one of the eight people who listens to our <laughs> po podcast, let us know. We'd, we'd actually love to talk to you. Because, <laughs> of course, she's listening to this in her spare time. <laughs> um, I would... Uh, I'm going to only surmise that uh, probably this first time out, it may have been a a slight discomfort, but maybe kind of a brush off because this is again only the fifth episode they haven't been working on it for that long so it might have been one of those things of oh i really i don't like that but you know whatever i got a job let's right so this may have been again it, it's so hard now god damn you joss i know um, <laughs> it, because now it's so hard to look at these things and say what is just an off character line you know what's just a line that people said oh this is what teenage girls 
say when they're snipping at each other you know so right. ignorance in other words and what is what has more malicious undertones it's every everything's kind of thrown uh gets thrown under the bus question. there yeah everything gets called into question you know so anyways that just did not did not make me happy yeah uh, as uh as cordelia is asking owen to meet her at the bronze that night he instead um asks buffy to meet him so buffy wins Yay! she gets to go out with the bland wagon uh but giles has bad news for her that there is supposed to be the anointed rising tonight 1000 nights after something 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 anyways it's supposed to be tonight so she's supposed to fight off vampires tonight and she's not happy mm -hmm. so they go and they hang out in the cemetery but nobody shows up so she's like okay i'm gonna go to the bronze then and he's like well okay whatever but as we see something was happening just not in the cemetery as a bus is going down the road the bus well i guess they call it a van yeah that was weird <laughs> it was, it was it's, clearly a bus it was clearly a bus but yeah it's um they crash okay so there's a creepy guy on it you know and, and like one of those creepy guys who's like prophesying the end of the world and the revelations and the the people are going to come and and that you will be judged and you will be found wanting and he's like really really into his prophecies getting up and walking around on the van bus talking about it and causes the bus to crash um yeah i mean did you ever when you were a young and actually this might have been before your time my dear um, did you ever know of a, of a cartoon show called A Pup Named Scooby-Doo? I think I heard of it. it was, I don't know that I watched it. It was a, it was a very fun nine, early 90s new update of Scooby-Doo. And, of course, going along with the Muppet Babies kind of thing. Was, there was Scooby and the gang as, like, elementary school kids or junior high school, somewhere in there, but fairly young. Uh, I bring this up because one of the one of the most endearing running gags of that series was there was a kid that Fred would constantly blame all the mysteries on and say, well, it has to be, it has to be red herring. <laughs> and that is and red herring was just the bully of the school, and Fred blamed everything on him. And every time I see a character like this, <laughs> that's all you think. My name is Red Herring. <laughs> spoilers jeez <laughs> again I, I if you're listening to this and you haven't watched Buffy <laughs> what the hell go watch the show first fool <laughs> I will not be I will not be spoiler shamed <laughs> <laughs> why are you listening to us if you haven't watched this show what well, I mean what are you hoping to get out of this? I don't know. We're just very charming. We are actually and adorable. <laughs> and we're cuter together. So, I mean, that could be a thing. Uh, well, that's true. But do you know who's not cute? Well, it's Owen dancing with Cordy. Oh. At the bronze. So, uh, because, it, you know, Buffy doesn't have to catch a vampire, she goes to the bronze and she catches Owen and Cordy dancing. And you can tell by the, the dance that they are, Cordy's pretty into it, but Owen is not feeling it. But apparently it still disturbs Buffy. See, uh. You see, I agree with that, but I'm watching it going, neither one of these actors is into this. Well, yeah. Like, neither one of them. I know Cordy, Charisma Carpenter's doing her damnedest to kind of play the part and go, ooh, I'm, aren't I the nasty bad girl and la-da-da. But just looking at the two of them, you can tell they're like, eh, 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 yeah, dancing. There's, there's no natural chemistry, and I don't think it's... I don't think it's on Cordelia's side at all. It's <laughs> Vanilla Pudding Boy. But then uh, again, uh, we're, we're coming down hard on this guy. I looked him up, and uh, 
uh, it's not even worth like talking about his uh, his you know standard character actor and a lot of stuff a one episode wonder you know uh, yeah. so we're coming down hard on this guy but let's be honest i don't think the character is supposed to have chemistry with anybody yeah you know yeah so, so it's maybe it's not all his fault but was he supposed to have rhythm because he doesn't have that either <laughs> well he is white i mean not all white boys are bad mm -hmm. maybe it's anyway. the music well the music speaking of oh uh -huh, segue our uh, our our band, our bronze band for the episode is the is the band Velvet Chain, and unlike any band we so far have talked about on the show, they are actually still together. They formed in 1993 and are still there's still a website that is active. They have ten albums, um, and their music is described as space jazz or moody groove music. So if you feel in the mood for some moody groove music or feeling a little interstellar space jazz, look up Velvet Chain. Um, okay, so I got there's a couple things I need to say about this. First <laughs> of all, um, congratulations to them for, for having such a long career. I, I gotta I gotta you gotta have respect for that. Mm -hmm. I mean ten that's albums 30 years, yeah. Yeah, 10 albums, 30 years. That's a that's impressive. So, so kudos to you, Velvet Chain, for, for having that. And that is, that is sincere. Um, but we got to talk about some things here. The name. Dear God, <laughs> that is the most 90s name for a band I've heard in a long time. The 90s loved the word velvet. Yes. Yeah. Velvet revolver. Velvet chain. Blue velvet. Mm. Man. The 90s loved the world word velvet and to yeah. wear velvet. You know, um, and okay, what was the description? What is it because that space something? Space jazz. Space jazz. Folks, I've watched Star Trek. I've never heard them dance into this shit. <laughs> you I, I have never seen the Starship Enterprise and Picard is like, well, here we are in space. That's my Patrick Stewart voice, apparently. Oh. Here we are in space. I, that's terrible. I can't. <laughs> let's, let's go to William Shatner. I can do it. Here we are in space. <laughs> we need some music. Spock, put on Velvet Chain. <laughs> they, 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 don't, they don't play that shit on the Enterprise. And if, they, if it's not on the Enterprise, that's not space music. I'm sorry. Well, I mean, they did play a lot of jazzy standards on Deep Space Nine. Yeah, jazzy standards. You know, notice, you notice they weren't all in Quark's going, hey, Quark, play us that, or let's go up to the Hollow Suite and go to the Bronze to hear Velvet Revol Velvet Chain play. Oh, wow. That would have been quite the crossover. You know, I mean, that, I mean, they didn't do that. So sorry, guys. I don't know who gave you that description, but. And that's how. <laughs> The vampires were introduced into Star Trek. Just because your music sounds lazy and tired doesn't mean it's from space. <laughs> uh, he said not being able to play any instrument and he sings like a, a cat yeah, being thrown into a blender. Like a beautiful songbird when you sing to me. <laughs> My Italian songbird. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that, honey. I don't think anybody else would, but you're the only one that matters. So that's all. So that's okay. <laughs> So, um, back to the bus, the bus has crashed, and as the bus has crashed and blown up, the people are actually okay until the vampires from the Order of Aurelius um, descend upon them, and five people are dead. How do you think you join these, these magical orders, especially if they're like, this Order of Aurelius seems to be something made up primarily of vampires, like, how do you get in? I am assuming some sort of paddle is involved. Yeah, I was about to say, is there like a hazing thing? Yeah. Do you pay dues? <laughs> is it like joining a union? <laughs> I mean, dental care would be very important to a vampire. They would need that. You'd think they'd ask, you know, 
we good news. You've been around a hundred some years. You've killed this many people. You're eligible to join the Order of Aurelius. How's the dental plan? Well, I'm sorry. It's well, I I can't join that then. It I, bites. It bites. Ooh, <laughs> pulling out old school Buffy jokes. Oh, that, the- that was on a lot of the t-shirts and shit back then. Like it bites or bite me or something like that. That was that was big back then. Uh, I had a t-shirt that said that, I think. <laughs> so the next day, Owen is uh they're back at school. Owen decides to ask Buffy out again. Um, and since nothing is supposed to be happening tonight, Giles gives her his his blessing and she goes. She's decided she's going to go out to the bronze with Owen that night. Um, So they are in Buffy's bedroom. Willow and Xander are in Buffy's bedroom getting ready for the date. Um, And this is one of the things that bothered you right here. So during this time, they're trying to figure out something for Buffy to wear, what kind of makeup she should be wearing. And Buffy or Xander's just doing his darndest to like wet her excitement and throw a blanket on on all of her plans. Yeah, this this does bug me. Okay, look, we we're hip to the fact. Let's just say that Xander's shtick hasn't aged well in these early episodes. But even at the time, this is one of the things that I was always very divided on Xander. Yeah, he, he Xander gets a lot of the funniest lines. He gets a lot of the best pop culture references. Um, and most of the audience, myself included, could relate to that nerdy outsider who's, you know, got the hots for the cute girl, but she doesn't want him. She wants the bad boy. We get that. And that's who he was made to appeal to. And that's, you know, he did the job, but even being in that demographic, watching him then, I'm just thinking, okay, at some point, you've got to know, dude, you're carrying this way too far. Right. And furthermore, the two females in the room never once given him any kind of, hey, buddy, you need to knock this shit off. Well, and from the perspective of a girl who grew up and was a teenager in the 90s, the fact that he was paying attention to her and he wasn't outwardly saying, hey, I want to bone you. And that, that was just behavior that you just accepted. And you were supposed to see it as flattering and you were supposed to see it as, you know, kind that he, and, you know, um, someone that was persistent and wasn't going to give up and was just going to keep after you and after you and after you was supposed to be, you know, an ultimate sign of a romantic. When, you know, now 24 years later, we realize that someone who won't take no for an answer means someone who doesn't understand what consent is. Yeah. And I, I, I know where you're coming from, and especially when you look at the pop culture of the time, uh, you know, especially the the teen movie was in its comeback, and of course, most of the teen movies had that character in them. You know, of course, the '80s teen movies had the ducky character, so I understand the archetype. But we talked a little bit ago about you know Buffy's line to Cordelia being out of character, and you know, I don't think it's out of character at that time for girls to start saying, hey, you are, you're crossing lines. You no, know? I, I just don't know. And you said, you said something earlier about, I mean, when we were talking about it before we started recording, you said something about her being a strong person and being confident, but there's a difference between being confident that I can stab a vampire and being confident that I can tell a boy no. Like, it wasn't thought of. You just didn't do it, you know? You didn't tell a guy to back off. Um, and if you did, you were seen as, you know, the militant feminist figure. 
Um, which, you know, nowadays I'm proud to be the militant feminist figure, but, you know, back then it was, you know, that was not something you were supposed to be trying to be. See, and I, I, I totally get it. Well, I mean, I, I get it to the extent I can get it because I, you know, I, I'm not, I never had to live it. So I, I but I, I get it, I think, to the extent I can. It's just, it, it didn't even have to be a back off, but, you know, one of them saying, hey, you know, you're supposed to be her friend you know, act like it. Well, this goes back to that friend zone thing. You know, for a long time, it was like the friend zone was supposed to be um, a term that meant that you were a good guy. You just weren't able to win out. Um, in reality, when you really break it down and look at it, the friend zone is my friendship's not good enough for you. Um, unless I'm willing to eventually sleep with you. So um, I think that I think that a lot has actually changed in the last 24 years. I certainly hope so. Sometimes we can it, it's hard to really remember how much that actually is that has changed. Mm. Um, and yeah, I know that you know and of course, I'm not Buffy. I'm not a vampire slayer that you know of, but <laughs> the audience can't see the goofy face I just made. <laughs> I made the face like this kind of what? And I was like, the people can't see that idiot. <laughs> it's radio, not TV. Uh, but I would never, I will not until, you know, maybe gosh, Definitely not even in college would I have been comfortable saying, you know, no, thank you. I would just like to be friends. Like even if a, even if a gross, horrible, creepy guy um, asked you out, you still said yes. And then, you know, tried to figure out a way to get out of it if you could, hmm. because you didn't know how they were going to react. It wasn't nice. It wasn't a nice girl thing to say no. See, and I, and I guess, I, again, under understanding uh, what you're saying in the, in the instance of the show, where it's getting really creepy for me this early on, is she's already told him, I'm just your friend. You know, that conversation's been had. But has it explicitly been had? No, I guess you're right. I guess she has, but yeah. Man, you know, it... it Mm, you really, right. you really do gain a different understanding as you go back and look at some of these things. Well, and you know, not everybody can have a perfect relationship like some people have. I know, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm, uh, so now I now I've lost my. Point. So they were getting, uh, they're getting ready. Oh, and Buffy changes with Xander in the room. Yes. Okay. And that was the thing that bothered me in this episode, in this, uh, in this scene, she's changing with him in the room, which he's turned around, but he's very clearly trying to look at her in her jewelry, jewelry box. box mirror. Yeah. Which is super creeper. Like that is, that is predatory behavior. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Um, Okay. Uh, Giles is here. He rings the doorbell and so is Owen at the same time. And Xander is trying to talk Owen out of, you know, touching Buffy or even going out with her. Um, and Giles is trying to say, you need to come to the mortuary and figure this out. And Buffy's like, dude, uh, what does she say? If the apocalypse comes, beat me. And she's got her little clear plastic beeper, you know? <laughs> Wow. Uh, so that was real, real hip at that time. Woo! Mm hmm So she goes to the bronze with Owen, who is super awkward guy. And I mean, like, oh gosh, like he was awkward with Cordy. He is double awkward with, with Buffy. He, this boy has no rhythm. And if you will notice in the scene, they are slow dancing and everyone else around them is kind of like more upbeat dancing and i just have to figure that this was as much as the guy who played owen could manage was the slow dancing well see in this point i am gonna i'm gonna sympathize with him as i too 
am rhythmically challenged. Um, I certainly wouldn't want my the the world is not prepared for the emotional and psychological damage that is I shaking my groove thing. Oh, I don't know about that. Well, you, my love, <laughs> um, you would enjoy it. Others would uh, consider it horrifying and perhaps need extensive, uh, extensive uh, therapy afterwards to help rid their minds of the image. So I can understand going, hey, can we just kind of sway side to side as opposed yeah, to... Yeah, but he doesn't even do that well. He's off rhythm, swaying side to side. Honey, this mm. is this is a this is an area you may just not understand the pain of. <laughs> okay. The pain of the rhythmically challenged. There's no support group for us. Um, well, there was, but you missed the beat. <laughs> That's see, and that is the kind of ribbing we have had to sustain for all these years. That's we're we're an unsung minority. <laughs> that's okay S laugh and mock if you will one day our time will come and we will rise up and march out of time <laughs> it will be very noisy it will be a very noisy very disorganized march some people going off in other directions we won't uh, be able to chant properly but damn it we'll be proud uh, I mean uh. I'm looking at the guy, and, and you're saying that, and I, I'm agreeing, but I'm looking at it going, I can't do any better. <laughs> um, I think you can. You've danced with me in the kitchen plenty of times for me to know that you have better rhythm than that. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, back to our episode. Meanwhile, Giles is pulling up to the funeral home mortuary type place in his very british colombo type car that he has i love the giles mobile mm -hmm. um and as he's getting out of his car and walking in here comes the order of aurelius so he takes off gets trapped in the embalming room shoves a, a file cabinet in front of the door and willow and xander show up at the window and they're like what should we do we'll go get buffy um so they go back to the bronze um to to get buffy and angel has shown up um in his velvet jacket we have the return of the velvet jacket but now we have velvet jacket paired with plain white t-shirt yeah so our angel style is is starting to morph a little bit um no tank top which i know disturbed you greatly a lot it disturbed me a lot it was a very weird look <laughs> um and uh then but like willow and xander show up and they're all basically like guys dude buffy this is a big deal you're gonna have to come so she's eventually she tries to ditch owen and go with them but when they get to the mortuary owen shows up there too um so willow is pretty quick on her feet and she's like trying to you know smooth it over and make it now seem so weird saying, oh, we want to go see a dead body. Um, but when they get to the mortuary, they go off and, and uh, Buffy manages to separate for them, goes and finds Giles's embalming room, which is completely torn up, bars ripped open, um, stuff everywhere. And we're meant to assume that, of course, Giles has been kidnapped and attacked. But then one of the fridge doors swings open and out rolls Giles on top of one of the bodies. Now, here's the thing about this scene. He has picked, like, he's, he's ingeniously picked one of the compartments to hide in so that the, um, the, the vampires can find him. When they go hunting for the vampires later, all of the rest of the compartments are empty. But he manages to find the one that actually has a dead body in it that he's laying on top of. He he has the uh, uncanny ability to pick the one that would 
provide the most comical entrance uh, <laughs> later on. <laughs> it's it's not your most useful of mutant powers, <laughs> but not everybody can shoot lasers from their eyes. <laughs> uh, Some people get the duds, and that just happens to be his. Speaking I, of vanilla guys, besides his mutant power, Cyclops was very, very vanilla. Uh, poor Cyclops. I know. I know. Anyways, um, before we move on, just one thing uh, going all the way back to the bronze when Angel shows up. So, Angel shows up. To uh, of course, give Buffy the whole "you're in danger, something's happening." That's all. That's what Angel does in these early episodes before we get the the big reveal. Ooh, I wonder what it's gonna be. Um, and Owen comes over, and of course, Owen's all milk toast. And Angel sees him and immediately like leans on the banister in this very kind of "I'm too cool for school" kind of like Snoopy when he's being Joe Cool. <laughs> just he instead of just standing there and just being you know angel just brooding and good looking and all that no he's got to take the thing hi there like J do the james dean thing. i really think again early episodes early days they weren't quite sure what kind of personality they wanted angel to have right because later on obviously as the character evolves and david boreanis becomes more comfortable in that Angel's just a lot cooler than that. It's a lot, he would just, later days Angel would just kind of stand there and just go, yeah, I'm Angel, I'm not intimidated by by you. But this Angel, uh, early days is like, uh, I got a lean, I got a cool lean to show that I'm the cool guy, I'm the bad boy. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty accurate. Yeah, he's uh he has to uh show how awesome he is, like how how broody and, and sexy he is. Um yeah, he's a little more jovial in these than he tends to be in later episodes, especially as you get into Angel. Not to say that Angel has no sense of humor. Angel is a very funny guy. He's just very dry, but sometimes in these early episodes he can almost come out as jollyish. Yeah. Um, and he's really not. Yeah, like, like I say, it's, it's very clear with a character like Angel. All the other characters, they pretty much nail right away and they'll evolve as they go. But Angel is the one that is just the most different from what he is going to become from the established character that he'll be. Uh, these early episodes, he is very far from that. Like they're, like, they're not sure what they want him to do. They're not sure the personality like i say he looks very um early days wb bad boy <laughs> you know but i mean think about think about it this way they, they, for, let's let's use a slightly more modern um picture both dean or jess from the gilmore girls and picture them in a leather jacket and doing that head down scowl thing well, that just looks like Jess. But I'm saying it's the same, it's the same type. It's the same character. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, even though those were on a, they were on a much fluffier show than this well, one. It's that then, same no. bad boy archetype. Then, you know, the character Dean goes on to play, which is um, not Dean on Supernatural. Sam. Sam, thank you. And now he's Walker, <laughs> Texas Ranger. Yeah, which I need to I need to catch up it's on. It's not a bad show. It's not great, but it's not bad. Anyway, <laughs> you tell this this episode is not giving us a lot. We've gone off on so many different tangents, even more than usual. It's just, I mean, it this is the Owen of episodes. <laughs> mm, buy our t-shirts. <laughs> Very good, baby. Thanks. So Buffy puts Owen and Willow and Xander in a safe room and goes off to hunt for for uh, the, the the supposed anointed. Um, they've barricaded themselves in by pushing chairs up to the door and stacking things on top of them like a lampshade, which is not logical in the least. 
Um, so Buffy and Giles are looking for the vampire. They can't find him anywhere. Well, that's because he's in the room with the, the uh, with Owen and Xander and Willow, of course. And I was like, dead, I've never seen a dead body before. I read about death a lot. Like, okay, here's the thing. This boy is so emo, but he looks like he's a football player and it's just incongruent. <laughs> so, so emo, emo football player boy. Um, so that is like, oh, our dead body's supposed to move. And of course he's a vampire and they're running out and getting chased. Well, as the vampire comes to life, he starts singing, but what he's singing is pork and beans. Pork and beans, I smell you. Pork and beans. I'm almost sure it's a reference to something, but I'm not 100%. Uh, it's, what. it's gotta be, but I, I, I'm sorry. There's nothing in this world that is as not scary as pork and beans. I, I guess. don't know. I don't know. I'm, it's not a very appetizing uh, combination if you look at it on the plate. No, like this pork and beans, like pork and beans that come in a can, like that's part of my childhood right there. And if you got to be the lucky one who got the piece of pork fat in your serving, oh, ooh, doggy. This is uh, another episode of Growing Up in Poverty with Rebecca. <laughs> um so anyways Owen actually tries to be a gentleman and run off and help Buffy without realizing of course she is the slayer and she doesn't need his help um uh, he's actually kind of helpful like he hits the vampire in the back with a cookie pan and bashes him on the head with a glass thing an urn um, an, an urn. urn yeah it was an urn so and the the ashes of whoever Whatever poor sucker that was went everywhere. Uh, so he's actually kind of helpful, but then he gets knocked out, knocked unconscious. But let's let's take a second here. We got to talk about this vampire. Okay. What a bloody jobber this guy is. <laughs> what a jobber, man. <laughs> um, and Buffy has had some good one episode or two episode vampire antagonist who I, I think we mentioned it like I in the first episode like with Luke oh yeah you know some good ones and we'll have some others this guy is just he is such a jobber <laughs> oh well he's um, like he's very rednecky um very I mean, not to get political in any way, shape, or form, but he definitely would have had a Trump 2020 tattoo. Mm. Mm -hmm. he's just, I mean, he's just a jobber. He's just bland as... <sighs> See, I just, like, he just didn't make any sense. As yeah. a... Oh, for, I guess I should say, for those who don't know, when I say a jobber, that's a wrestling term for, they used to have, or they still do, um, especially back in the olden days, like the 80s and early 90s, WWF, on their TV shows, they, you'd have your established guy, you know, mm -hmm. your big name guy, and they, they're going in to fight, you know, Slick Huckster or whatever, some, some doughboy who, you know, you've never heard of and looks like they just plucked him out of the crowd, and he's there basically just to get his ass kicked by your name talent. They call those jobbers. Because they're going in and doing the job. Right, which is to get their butt kicked. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, and sometimes when people lose, they still call it jobbing out. I jobbed to, yeah. you know, this guy or, or whatever. So, yeah. So, when I say a jobber, that this guy looks like some... I don't know who this actor is. Uh, nothing against him personally, but just the writing of this. They're so desperate just to make this guy the red herring. That this is the anointed one. That it's just it's it's just the, the the dullest bloody vampire we've seen in a while. No, I think he had I think he had some interesting aspects. You definitely would have assumed that this would have been the guy. You know? I don't know. They were laying it on a little too thick. Maybe, but 
this is a cheesy supernatural show. That's kind of what they do. But it's a cheesy supernatural show that one of the hallmarks about it is going to be the double take and the you think you're safe, but matter of fact, we'll see one of those not with the not with the not with the Shyamalanian twist, but we'll see that in the resolution of the Buffy Owen story here in a second. You know, showing you the expectation or the stereotype, and then doing the opposite. Right. You know, and in this instance, it's so not subtle. <laughs> you know, it's just you know, just he's just a bloody jobber. Uh, well, I. I think he served his purpose. Oh, he served his he is, purpose. He is not the thing that irritates me about this episode. <laughs> um, so anyways, he gets knocked out. Buffy gets ticked off that her date has been, like she assumed, killed. Um, that's how hard it is to find a date, blah, blah, blah. Shoves him into the oven and he gets, uh, shoves the supposed, supposed anointed into the oven and he gets burned out. Well, here's uh, another thing, because uh, you brought this up, and this is another thing. Folks, if I haven't said it before, all of life's questions, everything I need to know about life, I learned from two sources, the Muppets and pro wrestling. <laughs> so, and here's, here's another point where pro wrestling gives us an important life lesson. So when we're watching this and they're having the fight, Buffy, like, flips over the table <laughs> to knock into the guy and you were saying now what did the flip do it is a scientific fact that in a fight flipping makes the punch land harder oh okay okay again watch wrestling if you just punch a dude yeah that might hurt him but if you spin around three times and then punch him well that's science there's more force physics and things <laughs> <laughs> okay I, so she did that so the kick was harder flipping makes it work oh does the little twinkle sound they make every time she does a flip does that help too yes because it does every time she does a flip during a fight it doesn't matter how hard the fight is going it goes like okay let's emphasize the fact that it's a girl fighting okay i see i I don't think this is one time I'll stand up. Well, not one time, but I don't think that has anything to do with the fact she's a girl. It has to do with the fact that it's a flip. Okay. <laughs> it's a flip sound effect. It's not a girl sound effect. <laughs> you know, because that is a flip sound. <laughs> okay. I don't know. It sounds awfully pixie ish to me. Well, <laughs> I suppose there are boy pixies. Sure. Mm -hmm. So sh the thing that irritated me about this part is that um, when he was rescuing Buffy, Owen was really into it. But then when he kind of wakes up during the fight and sees her fighting off the vampire, he wants to go home. So the implication really is that, like, as long as he can be the knight in shining armor, that's all cool. But a girl that can rescue herself and might be stronger than me, maybe not. Maybe I don't like that very much. See, and here, here's where I'm going to not necessarily disagree, but I'll present an alternate viewpoint. Especially given what's going to happen in the next scene. I don't think that's what was going on there. I think it's what we're led, what we want Buffy to believe is going on. But I think what's actually going on is that he's hurt, he's concussed, he's a little right. out of it. Yes. He has the thing about, I think I'm just going to walk home. Which way's home? Now, yeah, Buff, we as the audience and Buffy as the character is supposed to take this as, oh no, my superpowers have gotten in the way of my of my life and you know all that but then like the very next scene you know when he comes to her the next day and she's expecting the breakup talk he's like nah that was fun let's go let's go fight evil some more let's go get let's go pick a fight with a biker gang right and this is where they have that twist so yes the next day they run into Owen at school and of course we are expecting him to say oh like this is awkward I suppose 
you know, I think we should just be friends. But he is really into the whole danger lifestyle. He's tired of living his Emily Dickinsonian life and he wants to um, go and, and find danger. He wants to seek out the danger. And so we actually see Buffy really make one of her first mature choices here. So instead of Owen dumping Buffy, Buffy turns around and says, you know, um, no, I don't think it's going to happen. I think that we should just be friends because she realizes that he's not going to know his limits and there's no way that she's going to be able to keep him safe. Yeah. So here, so here's a good example of one of the things the show was famous for. And that is that, you know, that uh, you think you know what's coming, but we're gonna we're gonna go the opposite way. We're gonna go a different way with it. You know, Buffy has her Peter Parker uh, moment of I I'm gonna give this up because it's the best thing for for other people. Right. You know, I'm gonna put aside what I want and, and make yeah, make the better choice for another person right so which actually leads us to one of the the sweeter aspects and kind of gives us a glimpse into giles you know because we haven't really gotten a backstory on what watchers like the history of watchers or whatnot and they don't necessarily go into it very there's not i i suppose you could put together a watcher lore if you if you really were looking through the whole series um but basically Giles says that he was 10 when his dad told him that he was a watcher, that his grandmother was a watcher, and that that's what Giles was destined to be, you know, and that, you know, Giles was, uh, wished he, he wanted to be a fighter pilot, um, but um, he realized that he had to make a sacrifice for the better good. Um, so we, I kind of see that glimpse into, okay, so this thing that Giles is doing, he's not just a, a bumbling fool librarian. He's been training for this since he was 10 years old. Yeah. And, and also a nice, um, a nice moment with him and Buffy, the whole, I'm not, I'm not trying to be a fuddy-duddy and ruin your good time. You know, again, because um, that's something that, all teenagers and all kids think parents are at at some point. I think adults are is we're making all these rules because we just want to spoil your fun. Well, like we I or, make or we don't. That's trust why I you. make the rules. That's why you make the rules. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and sometimes we do. Sometimes it's funny. Mm, you know, but no. what a what a young person has a hard time with. I, well, I see this a lot in 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 the high school. Is that you know, when you give the, the students a chance to kind of, okay, air your grievances, you know, write about what you want. And a lot of them come up with, why do we have to follow this rule? Why do we have to follow that rule? It's stupid. And you just kind of smile and nod and let them, and let them go because you understand they don't, they don't understand that these aren't in place for, you know. To make their life miserable. Yeah, they're there for a reason. And maybe you might not understand it or agree with it, but it's there. And I think this is a good moment with Bo J uh, Buffy and Giles where it's like, I'm not, I'm not trying to stop you from having a life and I'm not trying to stop you from, you know, having a good time when I lay out rules or stuff for you. I've been there. I know exactly what you're going through, but it's the way it is. Right. And I think that is, uh, that's probably one of the first real kind of bonding moments in the series for Buffy and Giles. Yeah. Matter of um, fact, I would go so far as to say this moment almost redeems the episode. Well, I would... Yeah. The twist is pretty good, though. Speaking of the twist, would you like to reveal the twist at the end, my love? Okay. So, uh, of course, the, the scene with Buffy and Giles ends with a little sitcom laugh. Haha, we stopped that that prophecy. I bet the master is pretty miffed. Ho, 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 ho! You know, and oh, uh, and then we cut to the master and he's speaking all evil and whatnot. And ah, oh, the anointed one is here. And he leans down and it was the little kid that was on the bus. 
Yes. So it was not the psycho uh, going off on, you know, scripture and all this. It was the innocent child on the bus. Now, I think if it this was a, in modern day, we would kind of expect it to be the little kid on the bus because the early aughts and, you know, the 2010s, they were really that every horror movie ended up being the spooky creepy little kid you know um but i don't think it was as prevalent back in the 90s it wasn't and uh this is where familiarity with the series kind of takes takes a back seat it's not a bad twist as twists go and you're right um at the time that was not something that was done a lot it's for me, it's more of a I know how this series plays out and I know this doesn't go anywhere. I, you know, it provides a classic moment for Spike on, upon his debut, but <laughs> it's, yeah. this whole, it's this whole plot point and this whole thing. Ooh, what a twist. You're like, it's, it, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> No, the, the payoff is not is not worth the effort, really. You know. uh, but it was an interesting little twist right here. Yeah. So, uh, so. let's break it down, my love. Let's, okay, well, let's go through. Uh, so we have a new one for the peril count. So Giles uh, makes the list this time. Yeah, so we are currently sitting at uh, two for Xander, one for Willow, Two for Cordy, one for Giles. All right. So Giles makes the board. Congratulations, Giles. <laughs> um, no, uh, no student body count this time, even though the title is Never Kill a Boy on the First Date. The boy does, in fact, not die. So no, no, uh, no additions to the student body count. Um, no real slang that stood out this time either. This just, just the just the pager. Yeah, the beeper yeah beep me you know so beep me if the apocalypse comes yeah but nothing really um okay so i'm curious about this one because i know i've got some opinions um so what was the best outfit of so, the episode i think the best outfit was while they were um hunting um or actually just waiting to see if the the vampire was going to show up buffy is wearing like black pants and this fuzzy tiger print zip up hoodie and i really liked that i thought it was really cute i think i could get away with wearing it um in 2021 i do mm. interesting mm -hmm. i that that's that i didn't think it would be that one which one did you think it was gonna be uh actually i thought that the the outfit buffy is wearing in the first scene in the library was actually uh which black pencil skirt and the blue shirt no it was a it was it was earlier on it was it was a dress it had i can't even describe it i don't pay attention to these things <laughs> but i remember looking i was like that's that's not a bad look but yeah <laughs> how anticlimactic sorry about that folks uh it was the tiger hoodie uh, i All like right. the tiger hoodie this uh, one i know we're gonna have a conversation on so what was the worst uh outfit of the episode so in the scene with at the bronze um there is a girl it's not one of the main characters it is a background character but i didn't even couldn't even uh focus on what was happening in the scene because she's wearing a blue sequin dress a furry white vest and an acid green feather boa like all together like what did you just like roll dice and whatever <laughs> it was, you just grabbed out of your closet and put it on. Like, oh my gosh, it was so many layers of badness. Like any one of those things would have been an accent piece, you know, but you put them all together and it basically looks like a toddler who went and dressed herself. <laughs> but you have some serious feelings about Xander's shirt. Oh my God, the shirt he was wearing. Like, I think it's like his in one of his many creeper scenes like like the first after the first time Buffy uh had to stand Owen up she's at her locker she closes the locker door and Xander's just there uh, like, Jesus Christ 
and his shirt. Oh my God. What do you remember what color it was? Oh, it was a teal shirt, teal. long sleeved button down with like pockets on the front. And it has circles of brown and like a brown, uh, black, white, and I think yellow. Yeah, like greenish yellow. Yes. The teal button up, I don't have a problem with. It's the multiple circles. And when you look, when they get a close-up, there's circles within circles. Yeah, there was a lot of pattern. This, this is what a migraine looks like. See, I'm not as disturbed by this shirt as you are. It was killing me. Like, literally looking at it was giving me a headache. It's like, <laughs> the, I when I've had a migraine, I close my eyes. That's what I see. That was just... <laughs> And I know that again, part of the charm of Willow and Xander and Buffy is their is their unique fashion sense. Right. But Xander, buddy, that shirt was two nineties for the nineties. <laughs> okay. You just it was a very nineties shirt. And it doesn't help that he paired it with like brown corduroys. No, it just oh, so yeah, I, I got I don't normally That's chime in necklace. with the outfits. He's got a white t-shirt under, under it with uh, a chain. He's always wearing some kind of saint's medal on a chain. And I don't know that they ever address what it is. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't normally jump in on the, on the fashion side. That's your department. But I, I, had to, I had to speak up on that one. Yeah, I'm not as disturbed by the shirt. Oh, yeah. man. I am. The blue sequin dress and the white vest and the green boa was what got me on that one. Mm. Okay, so uh, let's wrap this up. So final grade for Never Kill a Boy on the first date. It's like a C minus, man. And the only reason it's not a D is that moment with Buffy and Giles and the twist at the end. Um, it's, they really didn't do much with Willow in this episode. Owen is the, like, it's not even... It's not even right to call him vanilla pudding because vanilla at least tastes like vanilla. It's like it's pudding with no flavoring at all. Okay, that is that is who Owen is. Um, so yeah, it's a C minus. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, and I agree with you. Uh, I that's the exact grade I give it, and I give it a C minus. And what saves it from being a D for me or an F? is that it's not ambitious enough to be uh, right. anything else. Like, at least with Praying Mantis Woman, there was some ambition there. It didn't yeah. pay off, and it wasn't done well, but at least there was a big idea. This was, this was a status quo episode. Mm, this yeah. was a first season status quo episode to go, Buffy dating a regular person isn't going to work. Right. That's the whole point of this episode was to just point out because they've done the whole thing in the witch of Buffy trying to have a normal high school life. Yes. And that's not going to work. And of course, the next big thing is her dating life, because as we as we know, her romantic life is going to be a huge cornerstone of the show. Yeah, it gets a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so but they had to kind of do an episode about how the problems she's going to have dating. And that's right. all this episode was, was just an episode to show why she can't date. And it, it had no real ambition beyond that. And, you know, it like, I think you said it perfectly. You've said it perfectly twice. It's, it's not even vanilla pudding. It's the Owen of episodes. It's the Owen of episodes. It's just there. <laughs> Buy our t-shirt. It's the Owen of episodes. Oh, do you know what? We skipped right out over the power of boners moment. Oh, we did. <laughs> Backtracking. And this one you can see. Um, it's when Owen first walks into the library and Buffy's there talking to, and she sees him and she perks up and her little eyes just glow. And you can just hear the theme song. Because it's the power of boners. <laughs> We had a brief discussion about what the female equivalent would that would be. I don't think it's appropriate for. No, we're just going to stick with boners, we're which just, is it's, not we, really appropriate either. But. We are 
we are uh, a 21st century couple with open minds and for the purposes of our podcast females can have boners too boners are all inclusive <laughs> boners for everybody oh well I'll buy our t-shirts <laughs> buy our t-shirts again <laughs> Boners for everybody. Boners for everybody. Uh, so that is um, never kill a boy on the first date and never watch this episode more than once unless you're a completist. <laughs> <laughs> um, however, so the next couple episodes are going to be interesting because the next episode uh, I know is one of your early favorites. It is. It's one of my favorites of the first season. And the episode after that is my favorite episode of the entire season which is which one is that uh well we'll talk about that later Ugh. uh but next time we will we will be talking about rebecca's favorite episode of the first season when we meet the pack <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us uh always a pleasure uh tell your friends <laughs> thanks for hanging out with me honey thank you for hanging out with me it's the Highlight of my week, every week. <laughs> Bye. Bye.